Hey friends, Ben again. This is a video for vector calculus, and we are taking a look at the notion of line integrals. So your line integrals come in two flavors. The first is a scalar line integral, and the second is a vector line integral. The result on both of them will be a scalar at the end. What's really meant by the vector versus scalar phrasing is that in the one case, uh, the actual thing that you write out as an integral clearly has scalars everywhere that it's appearing. And then the other portion, uh, when it's a vector, there'll be a dot product that appears in it and two clearly uh, vector quantities. One is a vector field and the other is gonna be a parameterization, okay? So this is one of the many things in math that's easier shown than said. So let me see if I can get my screen to come up here and we will take a quick look. Yay, all right. So uh, if you take a look down there, I have uh, sketched some kind of a curve, just sort of at random. And the notion that we need to have in mind is that our curve is gonna be given to us by some parameterization. We'll have to say, R vector of t or you know whatever variable you're using for it and it will have to tell us where the t values are going between okay so when we talk about the curve eh, henceforth we will mean that so notice that on this curve that i drew here like that that it went from the left to the right doesn't have to do that but as t values increase you'll go from one point to another Sometimes you'll have to parameterize the curve yourself. Just always parameterize it in the easiest way possible. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. One of the things that you'll find out is that if you parameterize the same thing two different ways and do the uh, line integral two different ways, you'll get the same answer. The thing that's going on with that is that your derivatives and chain rule all kind of conspire to, to cancel out and end up with the same thing, right? So this thing that we write here, f of r vector, or they might not put the r vector in there. They might just say f ds um, along c. You have to a little bit stretch what uh, we're allowed for notation, and you have to think about that you're evaluating your function f, whatever it may be, at points on a vector valued function. That kind of conflates the idea of a vector and a point, but we've kind of been doing that for some time now. So think about your, your uh, vector, uh, your vector valued function as just giving you position x and y and think about it as a parameterization. So that means that if you've got um, an i and j and k components or whatever they might be, that you're gonna just pull out the x, and y, and z, and wherever that function has an x, plug in the x part, you know, all right? So then when we do the actual integration, we are, no surprise, integrating from a to b, but you take your function, little f, and plug in your vector valued function as though it was a parameterization. And then here at the end, this ds, you have to watch when it says a ds boldface, it's talking about a vector, okay? But if it says a ds and it's not boldfaced, then it's referring to a scalar. Um, when we talk about vector valued functions here in a minute, I'll show you the way that I tend to notate them. It's just a little bit different and I feel like it makes things a little bit less confusing. Well, maybe not less confusing, just less likely to confuse two things. All right, so, so in any case, as you are aware, all integrals are always going to be summations and you're taking a limit on your summation. And I can see that I, on my limit, did not put double lines there like I'm supposed to. All right, but uh, it's a summation and you're taking a limit 
As your partitions go to zero by partition, I just mean the little chunks that you break up your curve into. But your partition going to zero means taking it so that the size of the largest chunk is going towards zero. And f of r vector of t for some point in the chunk. And then this delta s sub i would be the length of the chunk. So if you're thinking about lengths of lengths of chunks and you're thinking infinitesimal, then that's where you get taking this velocity and uh, its magnitude speed and multiplying by dt and thinking about it as though it was a straight line. Okay. All right. But the uh, thing that we do with calculating is not going to be actually summing up an infinite number of things. We are instead using calculus. So in this one here, I say, uh, and I tried to make this into an example that was a little bit on the complicated side. It says, let your C be the line segments from 0, 0 to 2, 1, and then from 2, 1 to 4, negative 7. So if you're not visualizing that immediately, uh, don't sweat that too much. We are going to think about, let's see, maybe I will change the color of this to be uh, white. So we've got a path that goes along like that, and then maybe goes down like that, okay? So that this must be the point, what did I say, 2, 1, and this must be the point for negative 7, okay? So <clears throat> what we're going to think about is each one of those line segments is its own curve. And then in order to integrate this, we're going to integrate along each piece of curve and just add them up just like you did with breaking up things into sub intervals back in Calc 1. Feels a little bit different here and your textbook may make a big deal about, oh, let's do a piecewise defined curve. Don't worry about that. Just break it up into pieces. That's all there is. So with regard to that, I'm going to refer to the first curve as C1. If you don't like subscripts, then you can call it A and then the next one B or something. But I am going to have to say what my X is equal to and what my Y is equal to. And I am super lazy. So I always try to make my T that I'm talking about go from zero to one. And so if I let my X be t two T and my Y be T, then I can say that t going from 0 to 1 will start at 0 and it will end at 2, 1. Okay, so really all I did was to think about the vector that got me from 0, 0 to 2, 1 and I multiplied it by t. Okay, so in doing that, if I do my integral across c1, see here's why you might not want to uh, use the subscripts because it's multiple subscripts there. But uh, of this x minus y ds, it's going to be an integral from 0 to 1. Now we take the x, which was 2t, minus the y, which was t. And then afterward, we've got to say what ds is. Now remember that ds is going to mean that you have to think about this r vector of t and then this r prime of t and then the magnitude of r prime of t. Oh, I put too many primes in there. And that is just going to be the square root of 5 here. Okay, I'm going to take that figure in that I did and scoot it up a little ways so it's just out of my way. So square root of 5 dt. And then that means we're just doing the integral 0 to 1, t root 5 dt, and you'll end up with 1 half square root of 5. Okay, Calc 1 integral, you ought to be able to do that without too much problems. 
So then we need to do the second part, right? On the second part, we're going to say something about our x and our y. And we know that we need to start at the point 2, 1. And then we have to think about what do I have to do in order to get from 2, 1 to 4, 2? Well, I need to add 2 on my y part, and I need to subtract 8 on, I said that backwards, I need to add 2 on my x part and subtract 8 on my y part, okay? So all I'm really doing is subtracting coordinates there in order to get that. And then, um, again, think about 0 is less than or equal to t is less than or equal to 1. I'm always trying to set it up to go across 0, 1 if I'm talking about a line segment. That makes this sort of thing super easy to think about. Now, then I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here and say my r vector prime of t is going to be 2, negative 8. Hopefully, I'll see what I did there. The r prime is just the vector that takes me from 2, 1 to the 4, negative 7. Okay. And so now when I do my integral across C2 of x minus y ds, it is the integral from 0 to 1 of, and this would be a little bit more complicated, 2 plus 2t two minus 1 minus 8t. And then I have to say my ds at the end. So that'll be a square root of, let's see, 2 squared and 8 squared, so the square root of 68. If you'd like, you can take a, a 4 out of that and have it be a square root of, I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's embarrassing. Uh, um, 68 goes into 4 and 15 into 17. Okay, so we, get, so we can replace that with 2 square roots of 17 in simplifying our um, simplifying our square root there. But now the calculation that we have to do is integral 0 to 1. And I've got to kind of do this part in here. So 2 plus 2t two minus 1 minus 8t is going to end up being 1 uh, plus 10t. And then we've got that 2 squared of 17 dt. And uh, so we can do this integration, hopefully, without too much thought. t plus 5t squared, 0 to 1. Plugging in there, we've got 2 squared of 17. And we've got 6. Okay, and then we'll subtract the zero. So the final answer here, I'm going to grab this to move it out of the way. And I think I'll move this over to here. Okay, so our final answer that we get out of this one here turns out to be uh, one half square root of five plus 12 square roots of 17. Okay. If you're worried because the answers were nasty, try not to. I, you know, these are things that we can do with, with just arithmetic and grab a calculator if we need to. All right. All right, <clears throat> notice I'm zooming right along and going into vector line integrals because conceptually they're harder. Right. I think with the uh, scalar line integrals, you're just going to make substitutions. The worst part might be that you have to figure out your parameterizations sometimes. So with your vector line integrals, the notation for them is going to have what's clearly a vector field dotted with this dr. This is what I mean about I use a notation that's a little bit different because I don't want to mix up scalar and vector line integrals. So I always use a dr vector. Some textbooks use a ds vector. And oh my god, it is such a nightmare because they 
we use d little s in italics to mean your scalar line integrals, d boldface s to mean your uh, vector valued line integrals. Then when we switch and talk about surface integrals, it will be capital italic s and capital boldface s. Just, just use more letters, guys, just crazy. So, all right, anyway though, like before, we have a curve that's parameterized. As a matter of fact, I even copied the same curve in here. But now in that, we have this vector field, and it's going to be defined everywhere across the plane or some subsection of it. But I just tried to draw kind of a a vector field in the general area close to my curve because that's really all I need. Okay, so like before, you you should know that this is a limit of something where you're adding up things that are happening at at these chunks along the curve, but <clears throat> the dot product is kind of a big deal there. Okay, we. We often in interpret this with a force and a distance. Force times distance or force dotted with displacement is gonna be work. So often the interpretation that we put to a vector line integral is gonna be a total work done on a particle moving through a vector field alongst the path C, okay? All right, so let's take a look at one of these here. And for this one, we have the C given to us already, T, 3T squared, and 2T cubed. And the vector field is something fairly nice. It's just X, Y, Z. So in calculating this, uh, we are simply going to say equals the integral 0 to 1, because it said 0 to 1 in there. And then our vector field has the X, Y, Z. I'm just going to copy T. 3t squared, 2t cubed, because that's the xyz, dot with. Now I'm going to take and do the derivative of my r, and that's going to be 1, 6t, and uh, 6t squared. And then put a dt at the end. So now we have an integral 0 to 1. We'll have a t plus 18t cubed plus, uh, let's see, 12t to the fifth dt, all right? So 1 half t squared plus, let's see, 18 fourths is going to be 9 halves t to the fourth plus 2t to the sixth, 0 to 1. Plug those in, you'll get a 1 half, 9 halves, to two and then minus, minus zero, of course. And so that will turn out to be what? Seven, is that right? Yeah, seven, okay. Boom, right? So you have to, have to be able to do some of the dot producting and derivatives and so forth as you go along. But these really aren't that difficult of a thing to do, All right? Let's do another one here. Um, I don't know what do I have? Yeah, I've got a couple of a couple more examples here. So this one we're finding the work done on particle <clears throat> as it moves along this parabola. Now here I've um, maybe uh, maybe uh, confused things a little bit because I said y equals three x squared, and you're like, oh no, where's the z that's in this part? Well, the z, we're just going to have be 0 in this one. And so, so my r vector of t, my parameterization, I'm needing to parameterize the y equals 3x squared. Well, since y is a function of x, it kind of makes sense to let the x be t, and then y will be the 3t squared, the z will be 0. And when we need it in a minute, the r prime will be 1 and 6t and 0. So our integral is going to go 0 to 1. Now we've got to think about our f. Our f says 
x, which is just t, minus y, so minus 3t squared, z, and then um, x plus y plus z. Hmm. Okay, so x plus y is t plus 3t squared, and then z, of course, is 0. <laughs> oh, pardon me. Mm. And then the r prime, 1, 6t, and 0. And dt, so we have an integral 0 to 1. And remember that when you take a dot product, you don't get a vector, but rather a scalar. So t minus 18t cubed and plus zero dt. So we're gonna have one half t squared minus uh, 18 fourths, that sounds familiar. Nine halves t to the fourth, zero to one. So one half minus nine halves equals negative four, okay? So the work that you've got being negative means that, yeah, uh, when you have positive versus negative work, then it says something about the direction that it's being done in. And um, I'm going to leave it to somebody with a better ability to explain physics to say something about that. So, all right, last example here. This one, we're introducing a slightly different notation. So if you see integrals where they don't have the dr vector, but instead have a dx and a dy in there. That's what's referred to as the differential form. You can probably guess exactly what's going on with those. You're going to replace dx with the derivative of whatever the x is. Okay. Same sort of thing for the y. Now, if you're like me, you might need to stop and say, well, what is dx? because we've got to actually do a product rule on this. So it's a little bit of a mess, but 2e to the 2t cosine 3t minus 3e to the 2t uh, sine of 3t. And then of course, I should put parentheses and put a dt. So I'm gonna consider that dx my dy, similar sort of thing, 2e to the 2t sine 3t, but now plus 3e to the 2t cosine 3t dt. Okay, so product rule is a little messy, but you know. Now, you might worry about this bit down here, but x squared plus y squared, since you've got a cosine and a sine, is going to turn out to be fairly nice. x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves is going to be e to the 4t cosine squared 3t plus e to the 4t sine squared 3t and to the 3 halves you can factor and have cosine squared plus sine squared which is 1 and um, and then I hope that you all can uh, be distracted here as I change that to be what I actually meant it to be. And so then you end up with an e to the 6t out of that, right? So in doing this integral here, we're going to be doing the integral 0 to 2 pi x dx, so e to the 2t cosine 3t dx is what? Oh my goodness, that's gonna be just too messy. Let me scoot that down here so that we have enough room to write it. And this may go on to a second page. Sorry about that. 2e to the 2t cosine 3t minus 3e to the 2t sine 3t, close quantity, we'll put a dt all the way at the end, and then plus the y was simply e to the 2t sine 3t, and then the dy is going to be 2e to the 2t sine 3t plus 3e to the 2t cosine 3t. 
and all of that <laughs> divided by e to the 6t. Oh, I forgot to write bt. Okay, well, that is a horrifying mess, I realize. Um, but we're going to tidy it up as we go along here. And I am going to take just and shove that over here for later reference. But I'm going to copy it. I'm going to make a, another page, paste it in here. All right, now we have to think about what's happening with these. Um, if you will notice, every place in here has an e to the 2t. And so if we go ahead and factor that out, uh, we will end up with an e to the 4t coming out of everything. And then we need to think about this cosine 3t getting distributed here, right? So I'm going to go ahead and write cosine squared 3t. Oh, 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 I wrote, I forgot my two, okay. Minus three cosine 3t uh, sine 3t, okay. And then plus, now we'll have to think about this sine 3t getting distributed here. And so I will have a sine squared 3t and a, oh, I forgot my two, two sine squared 3t. And then my plus three sine 3t cosine 3t. Still looks like a horrifying mess, but it should be getting better at this point because my three cosine sines cancel out. My e to the 4t cancels and leaves a 2t downstairs. So I have an integral zero to two pi. And then up in top, I am left with a two cosine squared and sine squared, and they have the same argument. So it's actually just two. So um, I'm going to write it as two times e to the minus 2t dt. And uh, that is a nice integral. Integral of e to the anything is just e to that thing. But then you have to divide. And when we divide two by negative two, we'll end up with a, just negative one. We're going zero to two pi. So we have minus e to the minus four pi minus a negative e to the minus zero. So one minus e to the minus four pi. And e to the minus four pi is gonna be something really small. I don't know off the top of my head, but anyway. So, what has this told us? One thing it's probably told you is trig identities are going to come up all the time. Product rule is going to come up a lot. <clears throat> but here's the thing that I'm, I want y'all to remember. Don't just go directly to Symbol Lab every time. Okay. Look and see if it's something that you can actually do because most of the time it is because I have to write a solution key for these. So I'm generally writing problems that I can integrate. If I can integrate them, you can integrate them. So uh, it'll take you longer because you haven't been doing them um, in front of people, you know, uh, like a trained performer at the circus for the past 30 years. But, you know, something to look forward to with the next maybe 30 years of your life. Now, anyway, do see if you can do these integrations. See if you can spot these trig identities. Almost every time it's cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. You know, that's, that's the big thing. And then being able to factor stuff out. Anyway. And that's uh, got a few examples going. I think you all will be able to do this without too much problem. I will see you in class.